Thank you so much. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the, to the Urging the Super Committee to Go Big, Four Trillion and Beyond event that we're hosting today. And thank you to our audience on C-SPAN. Uh, I'm Maya McGinnis. Can we turn the lights on? I am the president of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Um, and as you just heard from that first video, our sort of foray into the new era of using video technology in our events, um, there are a lot of voices out there that have been urging this new super committee of 12 men and women that are tasked with finding $1.2 to $1.5 trillion in savings over the next decade to go beyond that and to go big. So last week, early last week, there was a letter that was released by 60 leaders from business, former Treasury officials, CBO, OMB, outside well-respected voices, all claiming or all urging the super committee to go big, even acknowledging that they had different reasons for why and what a package should look like, but that it's important that it go beyond its mission. And then later last week, there were 36 senators, bipartisan group of senators, and it was quite a sight to see 36 senators standing on a, ta a stage together pushing to do something hard, come up with a savings package in the trillions of dollars that included entitlements, revenues, all areas of the budget. So today what we've done is we have gathered really the leading voices in the budget area, right and left, um, all different backgrounds, to come together and talk a little bit about this whole thinking of why and if they believe and why they believe that the super committee needs to go beyond just its mandate of finding a trillion and a half to finding two or three times as much in savings. And I guess the quick reason I would give that I think it's so important and that we at the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget think it's so important is if you're going to do all this hard work and there's no question that what they are tasked with is very, very difficult. These are all the kinds of policy choices that policymakers have been ducking for the past decade of real spending cuts and real increases in revenues. But if you're going to go through all that work and all that political compromise, which it will clearly take, you want to actually fix the problem. And we're going to need something bigger than what they're looking at to actually stabilize the debt and put it on a downward trajectory. Uh, we also have been saying that it's very important that they go long, that this isn't just a short-term problem. In fact, in the short term, the biggest problem we have really is making sure that the economic recovery takes hold and stays on track. But this is a medium and a long-term problem. And it's critical that the members of the Super Committee uh, look at and are supported for looking at the long-term drivers of the problem. So all the areas of the budget that are growing faster than sustainable. Finally, we've been making the point that they have to go smart. So there are ways that you can cut the budget. And in some ways, this is what we've been doing over the past months, where you kind of mindlessly put in caps and push things down. But don't pick and choose what programs are working and which programs are outdated or unnecessary or not uh, well targeted. So if you go smart, I think you end up looking at the budget and saying, for a new era, you need a budget that focuses more on public investment and less on consumption. And if you go smart on revenues, you look at how to overhaul the tax system. And if there's one thing that we're probably lucky about when it comes to tax reform is that our tax code is so crummy to begin with, we can reform this tax code in so many ways that will improve it, simplify it, make it more efficient, and raise revenue. So at least there's a lot of opportunities there for that heavy lift. But I think go big, go long, go smart needs to be what people are pushing and letting the super committee know that they want to help them succeed in doing. So that's the point of the discussion today. Um, for those of you who have your packets, we have a bios in there, a list of truly phenomenal people who are coming with us to speak today. What I'd like to do now is invite my co-host of this event, Steve Bell from the Bipartisan Policy Center and Bob Bixby from the Concord Coalition to come up and say a couple words before we get started with our first panel. Steve. Thank you very much, Maya, and you've been toiling in these fields for a long, long time, and as many of us have, but you've done good work, and we certainly appreciate it. I just want to make three points. One, we're very glad to co-sponsor this today. As you know, Domenici and Rivlin are the co-chairs of our task force on deficit and debt reform and stabilization. Dr. Rivlin will speak uh, at the first panel. Senator Domenici will speak at the second panel. Number two, I would like to tell you that all the work we've done to date, the bipartisan caps, the Budget Control Act, have not essentially changed the debt trajectory over the next 30 years of this country at all. So all the fighting you saw didn't make much difference. And that brings me to the third point that Maya made. This group of people, the Joint Select Committee, has an opportunity 
to go big. It's written into the law that established them, in our judgment. And they can do the same, similar things, and uh, if they wish, to bring about really big changes in taxes and in spending. It's their choice, and I think only external pressure will make them make that choice. Maya, thank you very much for everything. Well, Maya and Steve, uh, pleasure to be uh, with you. And, um, you know, let me say I, I, I too, have uh, just three things to say uh, on behalf of the Concord Coalition. One is I thoroughly endorse uh, go big. Uh, I thoroughly endorse go long. Uh, and go smart. It wasn't on my list, but I'll, I can accept go smart. Uh, and uh, uh, what I was going to say third is don't go it alone. And by that, I mean some of the uh, work that the Concord Coalition does in the field outside of Washington is a bit of political advice for not just the Super Committee, but for all members of Congress. Because of the political difficulties of these choices, don't go it alone. Do things like Senator Warner and Senator Chambliss did and pair up and go to each other's states and try to explain why this is a bipartisan problem and that there can be bipartisan solutions. And don't go it alone also means bring the public along with you. The last thing we want to have happen here is the super committee go and make some deal and nobody knows what's going on and uh, nobody understands the choices and then something comes out on uh, you know, the eve of Thanksgiving and uh, everybody spends uh, December uh, trying to figure out what it is and arguing about it rather than uh, having a, a good debate and, and going towards a, a vote that might, might get consensus. So go along. Go big, go smart even, but don't go it alone. Uh, and following my own advice, I'm going to have to go hit the road and, uh, uh, on, a, on a trip, so I'm sorry I won't be able to stick around for the, the great advice. <laughs> Thank you, Maya. Good. Thanks, Bob. Uh, can we turn to the video before we introduce our first panel? Anyone who looks at projections of the U.S. federal debt sees that we are already at very high levels of debt to GDP. Uh, 90 percent gross debt, 70 percent debt enhanced the public. Those are historically high numbers and dangerous ones for our economy. But even worse, going forward, there's quickly going to pass 100 percent debt to GDP and then accelerate from there. That's an unsustainable trajectory that will lead to a debt crisis without any question. We are almost at 100 percent of our economy in total debt to GDP. And we have tens of trillions of dollars of unfunded obligations that are off the balance sheet. We need to start dealing with these issues before we have a debt crisis in the United States. 20 or 30 years from now, we're looking at deficits of 16 or more percent uh, of GDP every year. And that's just completely and utterly unsustainable. No country has ever run deficits like that and actually managed to, to stay solvent. Economists agree on very few things. But I think most of them agree the debt to GDP above 60 percent is not prudent. And debt to GDP at 90 percent uh, has a very negative effect on growth. If the Congressional uh, Deficit Reduction Committee fails, we're in serious trouble. Uh, we'll go into a tailspin almost immediately. Uh, in fact, uh, we almost went into one this last time around, but I think everyone was waiting for what they probably viewed as a doex machina that would just somehow come in place, save everybody at the last minute. But most people now recognize that uh, that can't happen anymore. Uh, the consequences are, are so dramatic uh, that even failure to come up with something now is going to have enormous consequences economically and otherwise for this country, and our standard of living is going to go down immediately. And I actually believe the first and indispensable step in a growth and job strategy is to show to ourselves and show to the markets of the world that the United States does not intend to go bust. And so beginning now to scale down the terrifying debt levels we have and deficit levels uh, and, and putting in place long-term measures that show that 
we're going to deal with the unfunded obligations that aren't even being counted in these numbers. The Joint Committee needs to go big if they want to provide assurance to the capital markets, especially to our foreign investors, that we're serious about putting our financial house in order. I believe that the Super Committee needs to achieve at least $3 trillion in additional deficit reduction over the next 10 years. We have two terrible problems. We have very high unemployment. Uh, more than 14 million Americans are unemployed. And we have a terrible long-run budget problem. And the, the answer is we just simply have to make progress on both of those things. And that's why I feel so strongly that the, that the right policy is to pair an aggressive jobs program today, which requires more government spending, requires tax cuts, but pair that with a much more serious reduction in our long-run deficit, that that absolutely is the, is the right economic policy uh, for the United States. Timing, I think, is the element. It's not an either-or situation, but it's when do you start making the cuts. And in doing it in a phased approach, I think, positions us for growth in the long term. Think of it as a two-step dance. In the short term, there are things that need to be done in order to get the economy going but they're not going to affect the long-term deficit issue. The question of the long-term deficit is separate from the short-term recovery. If we correct the long-term deficit, if we put in place proposals which will lead to a fiscally responsible nation, to one where we can afford the debt that we're running up, to one where our debt-to-GDP ratios fall below 60 percent over the next 10 years, then we'll actually help dramatically the short-term recovery because people will have confidence in our nation again. People have confidence in our currency and they'll have confidence in our ability to finance our government. But if we don't do that, then they're not going to have confidence, they're not going to make investments, and the short-term economy will slow, and the long-term economy will be disastrous. In order for, to give the economy, the business community, and the private sector confidence, in order to give the international community confidence, uh, we need to balance our budget and bring our debt load down. Uh, but at the same time, we need to, uh, when we get that confidence, uh, have invested in the short term in growing jobs and giving business uh, and enterprises and, and people who want to go in business the opportunity to do so and the encouragement to do so and the economic wherewithal uh, to do so. Well, you know, I, th I think if this super committee came up with a big solution which put us on a path or at least directed the key committees of Congress to put us on a path towards solving the long-term fiscal insolvency of this country, there would be a huge burst of enthusiasm and energy from the American people and the entrepreneurs in our culture uh, that would cause a, a major economic expansion and create lots of jobs and make people feel good about the nation again. Failure is not an option. I mean, we really do uh, have to deal with our long-run deficit, and we have put all, a lot of weight on the shoulders of this super committee, and they just simply, they simply have to step up. Great, thank you. If we could uh, have our first panel come up and join us. Um, Erskine Bowles was the co-chairman of the Fiscal Commission. No, all of you come up. You don't have to wait for your introduction. Um, Senator Mike Crapo, Senator from Idaho, was also on the Fiscal Commission. Dave Cody, the CEO of Honeywell, on the Fiscal Commission. And Alice Rivlin, former director of CBO, OMB, vice chair of the Fed on the Fiscal Commission and co-chair of the Dominici Rivlin Commission. So we have a remarkable and experienced group of people who've worked together uh, in different capacities putting together bipartisan deals that, in fact, did go big and could go big uh, and hopefully in many ways will inform the work of the Super Committee. So I'm going to be joined now by uh, my co-moderator, Peter Cook, from Bloomberg TV. And, Peter, if you are all ready, I'm going to turn this over to you for the first question to our group. Well, Maya, thanks very much. Uh, appreciate the invitation to participate in this uh, all-star panel that you've got here to talk about what is the issue in Washington these days. As a reporter covering the Super Committee and the actions that will be playing out here over the next few weeks, uh, this is, needless to say, a fascinating topic, an important topic for us, for our audience at Bloomberg, and important for not only this audience here, the audience at home, the audience around the country to find out why you all believe going big is the right move, because certainly we I've heard other voices here in Washington and elsewhere that perhaps going small is the better move. So let's hear a little bit about that. Erskine Bowles, you had the, uh, uh, the 
benefit of being the, the chairman of the uh, Deficit <laughs> Commission, uh, along with, uh, with Alan Simpson. You all came up with a package that did exceed that $4 trillion figure. Give us a sense from your point of view why going big makes sense for the country and is feasible. It was a, a great honor to serve on that commission and to and to work on a subject that I think is probably the most important work I've ever done in my life. Why do I feel that way, and why do I feel like this uh, this super committee must go big? They got to be bold, and they darn well better be smart. Uh, I think if they don't go big, if they aren't bold, they aren't smart. I think we face the most predictable economic crisis in history. Uh, I think it's clear that the fiscal path our country is on is simply not sustainable. And if we do nothing, uh, if we take the ostrich theory and just uh, stick our heads in the ground, I think that uh, the future of our country uh, is not very bright. Uh, what worries me is people who who go around saying, oh, gosh, we can simply grow our way out of this problem or we can simply and solely tax our way out or we can simply cut our way out of this problem. This problem is too big to be solved by any one of those solutions. We've got to grow, we've got to raise revenue, and we've got to cut spending. And we've got to cut spending wherever we find it, whether it's in the tax code or it's in the entitlement programs, defense or non-defense. And the reason I think it's got to be at least $4 trillion is that isn't a number we made up because the number four bus just passed us on the street. <laughs> uh, four trillion is the minimum amount you have to reduce the deficit over 10 years in order to stabilize the debt and put it on a declining basis as a percent of GDP. Uh, that's got to be the bogey. The reason I think it's got to be smart is this is just not an arithmetic game. Uh, I think it would be crazy if we did this and we didn't take into account the very fragile economic recovery we have today. So in the uh, recommendations that we made, we made sure that we didn't have big cuts this year or next year, but we did eventually get back to pre-crisis levels of spending. But again, we've got to make sure we don't disrupt a very fragile economic recovery. We also have a responsibility in this country to take care of a truly disadvantaged. So we tried to make sure we didn't have cuts that affected the truly disadvantaged, cuts in things like food stamps or SSI or workers' compensation. And thirdly, you know, we've got to invest. If we're going to succeed in what is today a knowledge-based global economy, then we have to invest in things like education and infrastructure and high-value-added research, but we have to do it in a fiscally responsible manner. And lastly, uh, as Myra said, the tax code we have, you couldn't dream up a more anti-competitive, uh, ineffective, inefficient tax code. And if we will simply broaden the base, simplify the code, eliminate all or most of these tax expenditures, which is just spending in the tax code, then we can reduce rates and apply a significant portion of the money that we save in order to bring down the deficit by a significant amount. I think that's the kind of thing that makes sense. I think it would generate dynamic growth of a country. I think it would create jobs here. And I think it would put America back on the road to prosperity. Senator Crapo, you're a sitting member of Congress, the only one at this table. There are questions about whether Congress can go big at anything, whether going small is the more feasible, more realistic option. You're here in Congress. You sat on the Deficit Commission. Why is going big? feasible? Why is it the right choice? Well, first of all, <clears throat> let me say I agree with everything that uh, my good friend Erskine Bowles has just said. Uh, all four of us served on the Fiscal Commission together, along with others I see in the audience here. And uh, we did reach those conclusions that Erskine just mentioned. A four trillion is literally the minimum we can do. It is not the ideal. And frankly, uh, I'm one of those who's a little more aggressive. I think we need to do it twice or maybe three times over the next decade to truly get ourselves into the posture that we should be in fiscally. 
Uh, your question was, can we go big? Does Congress have the ability to go big? And the short answer to that is that gridlock is no longer an option. And one of the – my answer to your question is yes. And one of the reasons I answer it yes uh, gets back to the Fiscal Commission and ultimately the Gang of Six that, as you know, I worked on, the famous or infamous Gang of Six, that was uh, three Republicans and three Democrats who uh, were able to come together on a very big option. And those – the Republicans and Democrats in that group represented the furthest sides of the philosophical uh, spectrum in the United States Congress. The reason we were able to come together is because the crisis is so real and it is so imminent. Uh, you know, we have had these debates in Washington, D.C. and in Congress forever over whether we should tax the rich or not tax the rich or who is the rich and how much do they pay in relation to everything else and uh, what programs are critical and what the safety net should be. But the bottom line is, as the Fiscal Commission concluded, uh, we need to have at least a $4 trillion solution and we need to see everything on the table. That doesn't mean that there aren't ways to, to protect the safety net. It doesn't mean that there aren't ways to make sure that in the tax code we have the fairness and the reform that Erskine has referenced, but it means that we've got to put aside our partisanship and get down to the business of doing it. Now, having said that it can be done and that people from very broad perspectives can come together, uh, I also have to say it's a very tough order right now with the political climate in Washington, D.C. Uh, it, it is nothing short of toxic right now in terms of the, the nature of the political battles that are taking place. But I believe that out of that comes an opportunity and perhaps one of the greatest opportunities that we have had in the recent past to truly reform our fiscal policy and our tax policy in this country in a way that will put us on a pathway to controlling our spending, but also put us on a pathway for developing a pro-growth package for this country that will create the kind of jobs and the kind of economic explosion that we are capable of if we will just create the proper climate. David Cody, your business experience and all this, there's a lot of skeptics out there in the business community that Washington get anything done that they can get even $1.5 trillion in deficit reduction, $4 trillion, tall order. For the business community perspective, what's riding on this? Um, let's, let me put a little uh, even overview context on this. Uh, Honeywell is about a $37 billion company, 130,000 employees, more than half our sales, half our employees outside the U.S. in over 100 countries. Now, beyond just making a commercial for Honeywell, the point is I travel a lot, and I get to see a lot of other countries and what they're doing. And it's important for us to realize as a country that 20 years ago, there were a billion participants in the global economy. Today, there are about 4 billion participants in the global economy. We've added China, India, CIS states, Eastern Europe, a lot of Southeast Asia that were not participants before. Yet we still act like we did 20 years ago. And we brag about winning the Olympics 20 years ago as opposed to what do we have to do to win it today. That's a long way of saying we need an American competitiveness agenda. And we need to get our competitive mojo back the way it used to be when our parents and grandparents actually got us into the position that we are today. There's a number of things we need to address. debt energy policy, math and science education, infrastructure. These are all things we need to do if we're going to be globally competitive. The part that scares me is that we're finding it so difficult to do what is a glaringly obvious problem and which through Simpson Bowles, I thought we had a glaringly obvious solution. And I would agree on the four trillion as being a minimum because if you look at the baseline that we used in Simpson Bowles, uh, we ended up at 20 trillion in debt in 10 years if we didn't do anything. And that already assumed the reduction in the war spending. It assumed 4.6% a year nominal GDP growth. And it assumed that Medicare growth would moderate from 10% in the last decade to 6% in this decade. 
If you said, okay, I'm going to be more realistic about those assumptions, that 20 trillion becomes more like 25 or 26. Using a 20 trillion baseline, you need four just to get to the point that Erskine and Mike were talking about before. If you say it could be worse than that because some of these assumptions aren't going to happen, then you're exactly in what Senator Crapo was talking about. We may have to do this again. If we do this in one, one and a half trillion dollar bites, it's better than nothing. But you have to assume there's a very good chance you're going to have to do it six more times. And when you think about the ridiculousness of our situation, I read something the other day that I thought was very helpful, was if you're trying to explain to a family what we're doing as a government, when you start talking trillions, I mean, it really gets difficult to understand. But if you tell an American family, you know what's happening is we're making $21,000 a year and we're spending thirty-five, dollars and we're going to do it for a long time. How long do you think that'll go? I think most American families would say, you know, I think at some point I have to declare bankruptcy and that's not a good thing. And we all know this problem will get resolved. And it will get resolved one of two ways. One is we can do it now, thoughtfully, proactively, the way grown-ups do things and the way our Congress and our President will hopefully do things. The other way is you can wait until it gets to a point where the bond market decides they don't trust you anymore. And with more than 40 percent of our debt held outside the U.S., almost a trillion of it held by China, there's a point at which they'll say, I want more price. I'm not going to give you any more money unless you give me more price, meaning a higher interest rate. And if interest rates go up on government debt, there's a tendency to think that's just a Wall Street problem. But the fact is, if the long bond, the 10-year bond goes to 7 percent, good chance home loans then are 10 percent, car loans are 13 percent, what happens to the economy, what happens to Main Street then? So we need to do this now, and that's why I think go big is the only way to go. We have to have at least $4 trillion to have a chance. And I can't assure you that if we do $4 trillion, that we're not going to have to do it again in a few years, as Senator Crapo said, because the issue is that big. Alice Rivlin, you've worn about every budget hat in the book here, Congressional Budget Office, OMB, been a vice chair at the Federal Reserve, $4 trillion. How hard is that really? There have been suggestions. It's not that hard. We should go even bigger. Your view on that and and maybe this follow-up question is, how much time do we have? I don't think we have very much time. And I'd like to follow up on, on uh, what Dave said. Uh, because I'm even more worried than he is. I don't think uh, we have very much time at all. If you don't solve this problem, and I mean stabilize the debt, uh, show the world that we are on track and stabilize the debt. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we may get our cup up, comeuppance uh, fairly soon. And in the form of damaging our chances of recovering rapidly, because we do need to spend more or tax less in the near term to uh, get the recovery back on track. It's worse than we thought it was a few months ago. But uh, if we don't solve the deficit problem in uh, quite fast, I think the world is going to look at us and we're going to look at ourselves and say, we're not competent. This country that we've had so much faith in all these years, wanted to buy their bonds, uh, is uh, really not facing up to ordinary problems and its government uh, doesn't work. That is very damaging to uh, confidence uh, all around the world, including here and uh, to the ability of our own companies to make decisions uh, that uh, will help them invest and for individuals to think, well, yeah, I have a problem with my mortgage, but I can begin spending again. Uh, it makes the whole world very, very uh, uncertain. Now, this super committee has extraordinary powers. Uh, you couldn't have written this into the Constitution. Nobody would have wanted to give anybody that much power. Uh, but uh, the ordinary processes haven't worked. So here we are with a committee of 12 people which uh, ha can uh, write laws uh, which change uh, uh, entitlement programs, uh, tax code, get it to the floor, get it voted on, no amendments, uh, no uh, filibuster, uh, no anything. 
that is a huge opportunity, and it's an opportunity to do both things, uh, to solve the double problem of uh, revving up the recovery in the near term, but folding that into a reform of entitlements and a reform of taxes that brings our uh, debt uh, onto a more uh, stable uh, path. But that's going to take compromise, and it's going to take courage. And I thought we saw that on the Simpson-Bowles uh, group. Uh, I became a big fan of Senator Crapo. He may not know this. Uh, and uh, his uh, uh, equally uh, conservative Republican colleague, Senator Coburn, uh, because they were willing to think out of their, outside their usual box. Uh, and they came, worked through the arithmetic and realized this is going to take some revenue. And I've always been a fan of Senator Durbin, but uh, he uh, also uh, came to the very difficult conclusion that uh, this is going to take reining in the entitlements. My party doesn't like that. That's not really good for me. Uh, but uh, I'm going to have to join with the others. Uh, and it was a display of courage and compromise that uh, I hope uh, will spread uh, to the rest of the Congress, and especially to the Select Committee. One of the oh God. one of the points that you all have made, or most of you have made, is that really four trillion is more like a minimum than a maximum about what we should be thinking about. And if you get to four trillion in savings, you stabilize the debt. It's on a downward trajectory, but still, it's well above our historical averages. Historically, our debt levels were below 40 percent of GDP. And if we say four trillion dollars that would put us at closer to the high 60s percent of GDP and moving down. And of course, you don't want your debt levels to be too high because you want the fiscal flexibility. If you need to borrow again in the future, if you're hit with more emergencies, which we will be, if you're hit with other wars, which in all likelihood we will be, the kinds of things you actually need to be able to borrow for. Um, and so I think it's important that people understand as much as, as we wish um, that you could balance the budget in the next couple of years. That used to be what we talked about, right? Balancing a budget. And we're so far off from that, that it really needs, it's critically important that at least the debt not be growing faster than the economy. And I think also when you think about this one and a half trillion, one of the problems with that is that it's probably not enough to reassure credit markets. It's probably not enough to avoid another downgrade. So to go through that huge political heavy lift and not have the economic benefits of fixing the problem is kind of a lose-lose for an awful lot of work. The question I want to put to the panel, I'll put it to the whole panel, um, is in many ways you start seeing people in the discussion, especially as the economic news is getting increasingly worse, sort of falling into one bucket. We either need to reduce the deficit or we need to have more stimulus. Um, and I think sort of the thoughtful thinkers on this, whether it's the International Monetary Fund or the Fed or some of the outside experts, many of you have weighed in how you can think about doing both of them simultaneously and how, in fact, Reducing the debt over a, a multi-year period in a credible and gradual and thoughtful way is actually part of an economic growth strategy. So I wondered if you could talk about how debt reduction affects economic growth, and particularly Senator Crapo, you may weigh in on tax reform because I know you have worked tirelessly on figuring out how to make tax reform that's pro-growth along with this as well. So please, well, all of you, jump in. Let me take the first stab at that then, uh because I think you've hit the nail on the head. We need to remember something. This special committee was created as a result of the debt ceiling battle that we had in Congress. It was a battle over extending the debt ceiling by about $2 trillion. And that's how the $2 trillion figure was achieved. It was not to solve our debt crisis. It was to counterbalance the increase mm -hmm. in the debt ceiling. And it's important for us to realize that because – uh, I'm concerned that uh, as Americans and as uh, a Congress, we may think that that $2 trillion target was the solution to our debt crisis. And one of the main reasons that we are here today is to point out that that is not the case and that we have to move further. And, and before answering your specific question, I'll just go one further step. A couple of days ago, we had before the Finance Committee, uh, a subcommittee on the Finance Committee on which I sit, five uh, very prominent uh, economic uh, figures in the United States. I won't go through all of their names with you, but you all recognize every one of them. And my, one of my questions that I asked them, the last question I asked them was, given all the differences of opinion about how we should attack this problem, what do you think, leaving aside the details, what do you think the minimum step should be? Four of the five gave me an answer. 
Two of them said a minimum of four. Two of them said a minimum of six. Wow. And the point I make, the reason I bring that up again is just to put an exclamation point on the fact that we have a tremendous task ahead of us. Two of them, actually all five of them agreed with this, also said that one of the problems we have, which Dave has just referenced, is that the assumptions we are making about the performance of the economy and the impact of the demands on our economy through our entitlement programs are unrealistic and that we are not even addressing the full picture of the problem in our analyses, and we have to recognize that. So given that, your, your question focused on where do we need to head uh, in terms of the balance here between uh, the austerity that we need in controlling congressional excesses in spending and a growth package for our country. And there is a huge impact on growth simply by controlling our spending and controlling the growth of our deficit. The CBO has put out some numbers on this that show that there are hundreds of billions of dollars of growth that can occur and will occur simply as a result of our control of our deficit. It's because of the drag that our deficit places on the economy. And then add to that the kinds of pro-growth things that this panel has talked about, tax reform, energy policy reform, regulatory reform, litigation reform, uh, and the like. There are a number of other areas where we know what we need to do, and we could create a climate where we have a very powerful pro-growth, pro-competition agenda that is accompanied by an austerity program with Congress controlling its spending, and we could put the United States in a position where the, the economic impacts of that would be the most phenomenally powerful part of the entire plan. Dave. Uh, just to build on what uh, Senator Crapo was saying, when we say $4 trillion would stabilize the debt, again, that assumes 4.6 percent a year nominal GDP growth for 10 years, when we're, not, we're already missing that. And it assumes Medicare, Medicaid growth moderates from 10 percent a year to about 6 percent a year. So you can very easily get yourself into a position where it doesn't stabilize the debt. It just slows the, the growth of it. You can do both the short-term stimulus and the long-term intelligent plan at the same time. And it's oftentimes, it seems to be teed up when I read things in the press or statements that people make, is that uh, those two are mutually exclusive. They are not. You can do both. And the long-term plan in particular needs to address Medicare and Medicaid. And that's the one that I get the feeling like no politician really wants to discuss. But I think the American public needs to have an honest discussion about what the impact of Medicare and Medicaid is going to be. And it's as fundamental as there's a demographic time bomb. My generation, the baby boomers, are retiring. And we're retiring at a very high rate. We're going to crush the system. There isn't enough money going in to be able to support it. The longer we wait for my generation to retire, the worse it gets because it is extremely difficult to take a benefit away from somebody who's already getting it. If you can reduce the program before people enter it, then I think you stand a chance. But this problem is coming. It's been coming for decades. People have known it. It's just that now it's facing us. And if we just look at the next 10 years, Medicare, Medicaid growth grows from something like $700 billion a year to $1.5 trillion a year, even with that reduced growth rate. Can't do that. Can't do that. Alice. I think it's not only feasible, it's necessary to do the two things uh, at once. Uh, and the timing is actually good. Because as Dave just said, uh, one of the big things that has to be done to stabilize the debt is to reduce the rate of growth of entitlement programs. But they're retirement programs, and you can't fix them quickly. So not much that you do on the entitlement reform front is going to affect the budget for quite a long time, uh, maybe 10 years or more. And then you get the benefits out uh, further into the future. And that has nothing to do with uh, right now. But it's also true on the tax side. If you're going to have a really comprehensive reform of the tax code uh, that gets rid of a lot of loopholes, including very popular ones like converting the home mortgage uh, deduction to a credit, for example. If you're going to do that, 
you can't do it really fast. You have to phase it in over time. So the kind of long-term debt stabilization reforms that uh, we are talking about and which ought to come out of the Joint Select Committee are not going to damage the economy in the short run. On, in the short run, we do need uh, more job creation and things that actually will widen the deficit a bit, but they'll help get us on a track to a stronger growth. Erskine? Uh, I don't have anything to add to that. I agree with what they said. It'd be just repetitive. Uh, I just want to have a thought, because, Alice, while you were talking, I was thinking Christy Romer on the video actually makes a number of the same points about how if you really focus on the long term for the debt reduction, that can help so much and free up the fiscal pay, fa space in the short run to do more on growth and jobs. Uh, and I'll just point out for these videos, they're all going to be posted in their long, full version, so everybody will be able to see them on the uh, CRFB Dot org website in a couple days. Give us time to get them posted, but they're very interesting because it's a number of thoughtful people weighing in as well. Peter, do you want to take Let me it? pick up on uh, something that you all have all touched on, but is the, the elephant in the room, the debate here in Washington right now. To go big, you have to put revenue and entitlement programs on the table, spending cuts. Senator Crapo, I'll start with you. This is going to be a tough choice for your Republican colleagues, those sitting on the super committee. What happens to revenue how do you sell your fellow Republicans on revenue as a component here? And are you talking the same sort of revenue that President Obama's talking about? You've put your finger right on probably the biggest issue that has to be handled between the two parties if we're going to resolve this issue, resolve it. I personally think it can be resolved uh, in a number of ways. But the most, to me, the easiest way for us to address it is to deal with the way that Congress scores various proposals. And as the Bull Simpson Commission recommended allow us to become more effective and accurate in scoring the impact of various policies. What am I talking about? Uh, in shorthand, it's utilizing dynamic scoring rather than static scoring. If you do that, uh, the impact of various tax proposals can be understood to generate the kind of economic growth that gives you the revenue piece of the equation without raising taxes. In fact, uh, what the Bull Simpson Commission did was literally to reduce tax rates, flatten the code, and, uh, you know, some people would pay more taxes under that kind of a system, some people would pay less. But the bottom line is uh, that we then were able to debate over whether an increment, if any, of that should be allocated to debt retirement as opposed to rate reduction. And I believe that th that's the area where we can get the most progress. But we can't get past that if we assume that there is just a static response of the economy to any of the decisions that are made or the proposals that are put on the table. So to me, one of the, the key things that needs to be done is that we need to accept the notion of analyzing the impact of various tax proposals with a static, or excuse me, with a dynamic model. And then from that point, we can analyze the kinds of revenue impacts that we need to generate for the economy coming from different proposals. Erskine Bowles, that's not a conversation that most people are having right now. Actually, it's a conversation that I've had any number of times in the last uh, several <laughs> weeks with almost all of the members of the super committee. I'm actually uh, relatively hopeful. Uh, I wouldn't say op optimistic, but hopeful, and I am for a couple of reasons. First of all, I think since we came out with our plan in December of last year, the politics have changed quite a bit. Uh, I think most people here in town have actually understood the economics and the need to do $4 trillion over a 10-year period. But the politics got in the way because it was tough, and it's politically tough for either side to make these decisions. But this whole debt default fiasco that we just went through, I think, brought the, the pain associated with doing nothing to the forefront of the minds of the American people, and they got educated on what can happen if we do have a default in this country. And so I think the politics changed, and if you look at the polls, a majority of Republicans, a majority of Democrats, and a majority of independents want to see a sensible deal done. They want to see this country move forward. Secondly, in order to, for something uh, to pass this, this committee, instead of having to get a supermajority as we did, they can only have to get a simple majority. 
And that's a lot easier task. We actually got a supermajority. We got over 60 percent of the members of our commission to vote for a plan. As Senator Crapo said, we had six senators on our committee, three Republicans, three Democrats. Five of those senators voted yes. So I think getting a simple majority uh, is possible. Third, uh, in this case, doing nothing involves a lot of pain because you're going to have uh, across the board cuts. You're going to have the sequester. You'll have $600 billion of, of additional cuts to the military budget and $600 billion worth of cuts to the non-defense budget. So doing nothing is not without its own, uh, own pain. We can do it a lot smarter. And lastly, our experience uh, with uh, uh, the commission was that the more comprehensive we made it, the more support we got. Uh, people didn't want to do this if just their own ox was going to be gored. But if everybody had skin in the game, if everybody was going to make some sacrifice, then by golly, everybody was willing to get aboard. And we got over 60 percent of the members of that commission, a majority Republicans, a majority Democrats vote yes. So I'm hopeful. Alistair, you want to add to that? You've, again, seen the congressional process here. There's not a lot of time for these folks, the super committee, to reach that 1.5, the limited amount of time between now and Thanksgiving. This can be a challenge just to do that. You all are asking them double down. We really are. And uh, I think the 1.5 or the sequester, either way, the sequester is worse. Uh, but uh, if uh, they uh, only do that, uh, then uh, they really will have failed uh, because they will not have stabilized the debt or shown that we can solve the uh, long-run problem, and they won't have done anything about the short-run problem either. So uh, the only way you do that is to go, uh, go big. I wanted to come back to tax reform because I think the potential there is for a real win-win. Uh, that can, you mentioned the president and asked Senator Crapo if his plan was the same as the president's. He, he wisely didn't answer that. Uh, but uh, uh, what the president emphasized in his speech uh, was uh, higher uh, uh, contributions from uh, upper income people. Now, when you look at a thoroughgoing tax reform of the sort that we did in Domenici Rivlin or in the uh, Simpson Bowles, uh, liberals often look at it and say, oh, I don't like that. It's lowering the tax rates, and that's easier on rich people. No, it isn't. You have to look at what happens uh, to the deductions and exemptions and exclusions, because those benefit upper-income people uh, disproportionately. And you can do a tax reform that I believe will uh, be very pro-growth and no less progressive than our current system. You have a thought as to what the breakdown should be between Again, revenue on one side and, and spending reductions on the other. What's the right uh, – the, the Oh, right there's right no there? right mix. Uh, the big point is we have to do some of each. And that's where the, our task force and the Simpson-Bowles group and everybody who has studied this problem says you can't get there on the spending side alone. You can't get there on the revenue side alone. You want to weigh in? It, yeah. Uh, First of all, I think we got it right on Simpson-Bowles also, and I voted for it for that reason. And I think uh, Erskine said it right, is uh, it affected everybody. And we tried to think about things differently, right? Okay, there were the spending reductions, but we tried to do it thoughtfully. There, were, uh, there was additional revenue. But again, I think we did that thoughtfully by saying, let's take this time to rethink the tax code so that everybody wins in this, even if you pay more, there's a way to win in this because you end up with a better economy, a simpler system, something that everybody understands. And I'm a, a, a big advocate of just continuing that path and thinking about it that way. I've been asked uh, a number of times after having spent time on this commission and spending more time down here, uh, what, what are some of the observations? And I've got a couple uh, that I'll share. One is I say that every conversation here is ruled by the three H's. Hysteria, histrionics, and hyperbole. <laughs> Everything. I mean, I've never seen, I've said to guys like uh, Senator Crapo, I, I don't know how you get your jobs done. I can't re believe the ridiculousness of the conversations and to the point where there were meetings where I would actually look at someone and say, you can't possibly believe what you just said. <laughs> it's just, it, it's totally illogical. And I take a look at the spending reductions that we had in Simpson Bowles. And you hear words like uh, drastic, draconian, and destroying, pick whatever your favorite group is, 
you're, you're destroying them. So I did a little math just to get a sense for it and found that, okay, if you did nothing, the average annual growth rate in spending was 5%. If you enacted Simpson-Bowles, the average annual growth rate in spending was 4%. The difference is 5 and 4. Yet it's drastic, it's draconian, you're destroying things. I've never seen such ridiculousness of language put around something that I view as an American competitiveness issue. In terms of do I think something can happen, I'm, uh, one of the things is uh, my other learnings, having spent some time here, is I am not a political savant. So I, I can't, I guess, predict that one. But one of the things that has struck me, as I've said, uh, growing up in New Hampshire and uh, running companies, one of the things I always learned is what I thought, what I said, what I did, all had to be the same thing. Whereas here, that's three different decisions. <laughs> <laughs> so what people are saying isn't necessarily what they're thinking, isn't necessarily what they're willing to do. And I'd like to think that if everybody can understand the magnitude of the problem that we're dealing with, recognizing the whole system is supposed to be geared up to compromise, that we can accomplish what's going to be an important fundamental for the country's growth. And make it easy for all of us to find it. Yeah, I'd say actually that's a fair criticism of what we did. We had a, a paid staff of exactly two uh, for our commission work, which I consider to be one of the most important endeavors of my life and for my generation. Uh, so I think from a marketing viewpoint, we probably did a pretty poor job. Uh, however, the information is there. As an example, people, I always hate when I watch these Sunday shows and you ask people, well, you're talking about cuts in the defense budget. And, but what would you cut? You know, and they say, well, but, but, you know, they don't have any specifics. Uh, we, we detailed every single cut. In matter of fact, we gave more cuts than we actually had to use in order to meet our recommendations. And we were very specific whether it was for defense or non-defense or for the entitlement programs. And I think that's what you deserve, and that is available on our website. But people have to dig for it. Yeah. And, and one thing I learned from Mike Mullen, who's chair of faculty. Shins, Mike. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. The one thing I learned from Mike Mullen, if it takes more than five minutes for him to look at it and understand it, he won't look at it. I think it's a lesson you all need to learn. The narrative really matters. And I haven't been able to understand your narrative beyond the first layer, and I actually care. But I don't have time to do the digging you're proposing we do. It's like doing research reports at these think tanks. They're nicely written, and they go on a bookshelf. Yeah, this is a little bit different, though. I think uh, that's not a fair criticism. I think if you would actually go and read our report, it's not like a 700-page report. There are a lot of appendix to it, but the report itself is 67 pages. And it's written in very, very plain English, and I guarantee you, you can understand it. That's actually one of the improvements I've noticed recently, that for years when people were talking about this issue, they either were talking about things that would make it worse, or if they were talking about improving it, they were just talking about principles, because principles always sound really nice. And one of the things about the Fiscal Commission and also Domenici Rivlin Commission is that even when they said sort of this is a framework for how something could work, because in discretionary spending, for instance, you do it through caps, they then proceeded to put illustrative examples of how you would fill in all those savings. So you do have to dig somewhat, but if you go and you look for the Fiscal Commission or the Domenici Rivlin Report, there are actually so many policies out there that have been fully developed, fleshed out. I think it's actually one of the advantages the Super Committee has is that the work has been done. They actually have these wonderful starting points of these comprehensive reports with details of reforms that in most cases have been supported in a bipartisan way. And so now it's kind of the political discussion of how to, to work out the details and come up with a compromise. Yeah, that's one of the things that gives me comfort that they can actually do this by November 23rd. You know, the base work has been done. David. Well, uh, there's too much agreement here. You so must I'd identify like yourself. <laughs> David Stockman. Uh, I'd like to cause some dissension. Uh, it's obvious that when you're spe spending 24 percent and you're taking in 15 percent, you need a massive new source of revenue. We've had a 30-year referendum on spending. We're going to cut a little bit, but not much. 
And that should be either a consumption tax or a Tobin tax on Wall Street. Because after all, those robots trading with each other and all the boys and girls running around Wall Street are not doing anything that's very important or interesting uh, 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 for the economy right now. But uh, what we hear instead is the great white hope is tax reform. And I'd like to suggest to this group and see your reaction that tax reform, at the end of tax reform, is a massive swamp at the end of Gucci Gulch, which will lead to massive political conflict and result in even worse polarization than we have today. Why? Just quickly. There's supposedly a trillion of tax expenditures. Two hundred billion of that is the preference for capital gains and dividends. A hundred and eighty billion of that is the preference for retirement, employer plans, IRAs, et cetera, et cetera. One seventy billion is medical in all its different. One twenty billion is homeowner in all its different pieces. You put that together, it's $700 billion. In which part of that are you going to blast away? How much revenue are you going to get out of the lower tax rates that you might be able to trade off? I think it's the wrong direction. It will not solve the revenue problem. It will immerse the system in conflict for a long period of time. Meanwhile, the red ink will continue to billow. The bonds will continue to be issued and will be tempting fate in the role of bond market by the day. So uh, I would, uh, you know, throw that out uh, because there's too much consensus about tax reform. It's a great idea, but I don't, I don't see it, it is a uh, productive uh, route to go, even though it sounds great. Let me take the first stab at that because uh, I'll have to disagree with you. You've got your conflict now. Uh, <laughs> you, you certainly are right that reforming the tax code is an incredibly difficult task, and getting into the weeds of doing that is a complicated and diff difficult thing. Uh, but just to use the Bull simpson model as one example, and, and when we were deliberating as Bull simpson we had before us oh, a, a number of different tax proposals that had been very well thought out by a number of very prominent uh, analysts. Uh, different kinds, ranging from a consumption-type tax to uh, income tax, but or mixtures of the two. Uh, and, and admittedly, they didn't get down into the weeds to the kind of detail that you say will cause the political strife, but the Bowles-Simpson Commission basically did. They dealt with each of the examples that you talked about in their illustrative option and, in fact, did it down to the numbers. And by doing so, were able to show on those specific tax expenditures as well as the others which they proposed to eliminate how you could then compensate by reducing the rates. Now, many people say to me, oh, you know, this special committee uh, can't deal with tax reform because it's just too complicated to get it done by December. Well, it may be true that it's too complicated to write every sentence and dot every T and cross every I by December, but it's not too complicated to, to statutorily put into place the parameters of a tax reform package and then task Congress to do it. And, and I think they can do it, whether it's the Simpson-Bowles model or some different model. Uh, I think it can get done. Now, one thing I will agree with you on, because I and everybody here on the panel have experienced it, and that is once you propose it, the knives come out. <laughs> Every single special interest group in America, I think, was activated when we put our proposal on the table. And I felt it from the front and the back, and uh, still am. Uh, so I, I will admit to you that it is a ferocious fight out there, but I will tell you that at the same time, I got an equal number, if maybe not even more, uh, compliments from people saying, you know what, we've got to do this, and it's time for America to take this opportunity and move forward. Yeah. Uh, David, we, we did look at a consumption tax, as I think you probably know, and we spent a lot of time talking about it. And many of us on the commission prefer a consumption tax to a tax on work or a tax on capital uh, as a better way to finance uh, the operations of the country. And you can do a consumption tax so it's not as regressive as it might be if you didn't uh, take that into account. However, I thought the, uh, there were two reasons we didn't do it. One, there was a a sense of the Senate that passed while we were meeting that I think passed, uh, was it 87 or 93 to nothing. And I thought that was a pretty clear signal that we weren't going to make progress on the consumption tax. But more importantly, I thought the Republican members of our commission made a very good argument. And that was, if unless you're going to eliminate the income tax, 
if you have an income tax and a consumption tax, then what you have created is two engines of revenue. And over time, those two engines will barrel ahead, and you'll end up having taken too much revenue out of the economy. Uh, and therefore, we, we set it aside. We, we then looked at other alternatives. And I was personally amazed to see that we have about $1 trillion worth of revenue that comes into the country in corporate and, uh, and individual income tax. That's the net number. That's after $1.1 trillion of these tax expenditures. And all these tax expenditures are is spending in the tax code. It's just spending by another name. So we said in our zero option, as an example, which is one of the options we put out there, what if we just eliminated all of these tax expenditures? What could we do with rates? And what if we used 90% of it, or around 90% of it, we ended up using 92% of that money to reduce rates, and 8% of it to bring down uh, the deficit? Uh, under that approach, we could reduce the deficit by a trillion dollars over 10 years, and we could take income tax rates to 8% up to $70,000, 14% up to $210,000, have a maximum marginal rate of 23%. We could take the corporate rate to 26%, and we could pay for putting in a territorial system so that that trillion dollars that's now captured overseas could be brought back to this country to create jobs over here. We thought that would create dynamic growth in the country and would bring down the, the deficit, and it could be done in a very progressive manner. We did a distributional analysis on our work, and doing this, as Alice said earlier, was just as progressive is our current tax code. So we thought this was a viable way to go forward. I think the short answer is there's a potential bipartisan coalition for simplifying the tax code, broadening the base, and bringing down the rates. It appeals to both Democrats and Republicans. There is no such co uh, coalition uh, in favor of a consumption tax. In the Dementia Rivlin report, we did have a broad-based consumption tax, uh, but uh, we came to uh, think that was not really feasible because everybody's against it. Uh, the Democrats are against it because they think it's regressive, uh, and the Republicans are against it because it's a new tax and it might raise too much money. So you, you have a negative coalition there. Wasn't that always that famous Larry Summers saying where he always said when they realized the opposite, then everyone would come to rally around it, when the Republicans <laughs> realized it was regressive and Democrats realized it raised so much money? But <laughs> That's true. Dave? The, uh, just to build on Erskine's point on the VAT, I'd have to say uh, I went into this thinking that I should be open-minded about it and take a look at it, uh, read a book about it, talk to a number of people. And uh, this was kind of one of the other learnings when uh, uh, Erskine explained the concern about two engines of growth is uh, we were having a conversation one day in one of the committee meetings, and I, 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 had, I had relatively immersed myself in the budget details, so understood it, but they started talking about uh, caps, triggers, sequesters, and I, I had, was having a really difficult time following all this stuff. And I, I finally turned to someone and said, you know, this sounds to me like your Congress is trying to protect itself against Congress. And they said, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> and when you start thinking about it that way, saying, and you throw in this whole new dynamic with the VAT, I, I, it made me nervous and caused me to start thinking the other way. In terms of the conflict, I t the conflict's going to be there anyway. You're talking about 4 to $8 trillion over the uh, next 10, 15 years. There's, the conflict's going to be there. And I thought, I was at a meeting with uh, uh, Senator Blunt this morning, and I thought he gave us a an interesting American history lesson kind of going through over the last 230 years the various points in time where there were major times of controversy followed by big decisions that put the country on the right path for the next or developed the path for the country over the next 20 or 30 years. And he pointed out Jefferson, Jackson, Lincoln, Lyndon Johnson, Teddy Roosevelt, FDR, Reagan being the last one in his view. But he said, and I, I thought it was interesting, is that given what we're facing right now, we're at another one of those times. And when you put it in the context of the one billion participants I was talking about, and now we have four billion participants in the global economy, 
Like that really, for me, that really brought that comment home that said, I think this is one of those times and we need to have this discussion. We can't avoid it. If we really want to be the kind of global economic power that we are today and we want to have that same kind of position for our kids and grandkids, we need to be having these conversations now. We have Let me pick up one thing really, really quick, if I could. Yeah. Senator Crapo. Mr. Cody says this is the time. There are some here in Washington who suggest the time was actually back in December when you all came out with your plan. Now, we're too close to a presidential election. There's no way to get a big deal now. Well, first of all, the closer we get to an election, particularly a presidential election, the harder it gets. That's just a political fact of life. But I refuse to accept the, the, um, the so-called political wisdom that we just have to wait till after the next election. For one thing, as pretty much everybody on this panel has said, we don't have that long to wait. I, I think that if we wait another 18 months, uh, we lose critical time, both in terms of being able to create the adequate solutions and in terms of being able to get the political momentum. Secondly, the detail work has been done, not only by the commissions we've talked about here, but by many others. It's not a problem of trying to figure out how to do the different solutions in the discretionary budget or the entitlement budgets or in the tax reform. It's a problem of building the political consensus. And I, I personally believe that now is the time, and it's, it is doable if we will not tell ourselves that we can't do it. We have the capacity to do it. In fact, the reason we're all here today is to tell the Congress, I hope, and to tell the American people that we have an incredible opportunity out of this crisis that we face to build, to, as, as Dave said, to, to put America on the kind of path that we all know we want to be on. The American people, the American people are far better educated about the perils of this debt today than they were back in December. Nobody believed back in December that we could get a majority, majority to vote yes for our plan, and we got a super majority to vote yes. Um, we're going to move on to the next panel, but I just want to close with an observation. One more question for Erskine. But so much of this panel ended up focusing on tax reform, which is really interesting because taxes is one of the biggest sort of hot spots in this whole thing. Are we going to? Are we not going to? If we do, how are we? And I think there are ways to get around that, which is pro-growth tax reform. There is a, a bipartisan consensus about how that could work, how it's good for the economy, it simplifies the tax code, and it can generate raised revenues to close the deficit. Um, but the other piece of that is that really only goes hand in hand with fundamental entitlement reform. And I think that's another reason that people have been hesitant to put in a new revenue stream, because what you really want to make sure is that the drivers of the problem, our health care and our retirement programs, actually are reformed in a way that are sustainable, and that you want that to be paired with the tax reform. And I think one of the things, Erskine, when I've listened to you and Senator Simpson talk on the road and all around about this and your experience on the commission, is that the more you brought all those pieces onto the table and the more, in fact, that on the commission you went big, much to your surprise, instead of losing people, you kept getting more people coming on. So if you wouldn't mind just closing with, with that observation. Yeah, but simply the more comprehensive we made it, uh, the more skin that everybody had in the game, the more people uh, were willing to support it. Uh, the answer to this whole question is, look, the problems the nation faces are real. They are big, and the solutions are all going to be painful. Dick Durbin said when he voted yes to this plan, there were things in this plan that he hated more than the devil hated holy water. <laughs> <laughs> but he voted yes because he didn't believe this nation had any other choice. The problems are real, the solutions are painful, and there is no easy way out, and we simply have to face up to it and go big or go home. All right, thank you. I'd like to thank this panel while the second panel comes up. Thank you so much.